Coming up on the Big Water Podcast, my longtime friend and sponsor, Reef Runner Lure owner, Scott Stecker. You're going to want to hear about the whole workings at Reef Runner, because back in the day, it wasn't what you think it is. Welcome to the Big Water Podcast. I'm Captain Ross Robertson. You know, fishing is what we do, and today we've got a guy who I've known for a very long time, more than 20 years, Scott Stecker, the man behind Reef Runner Lures. Scott, thanks for coming on with us. Thanks for having me, Ross. Uh, lovely day to, to do this. It is. It's, it's one of those things that uh, there's never a bad time, but sometimes there's not a good time. Oh, I was going to say no doubt. I mean, you know me, and you've known me long enough that, uh, yeah, how long did I have a flip phone forever and... Uh, you know, trying to get into this technology world, I, I think the only uh, only podcast I've ever witnessed was uh, on uh, with Big Bang Theory when uh, Sheldon and Amy uh, used to do their uh, podcast with Fun with Flags. You know, I, I was uh, yeah, I was wondering if you were going to have to talk to your kids about what a podcast even was. I don't know. If I it, know. Did that conversation take place? Uh, yeah, they were excited about it, but they yeah, they were like. What time and what, I don't know, I don't know. So, yeah, I'm, it's, it's all a learning curve, man. It's all learning. Well, you know, we, we joke about how long I've known you. I was trying to add it up, and I think it's about 24, 25 years, believe it or not. And do you, I don't know if you remember when I actually met you for the very first time. You know, I can't even remember what I had for dinner yesterday, you know. I know. So. It, it was at a McDonald's in Catawba. That was when the, uh, I was working at Netcraft at the time, still in high school. Yep. And yep. that's when I think the ripstick was the first one. And Netcraft had some of the first ripsticks, if I'm not mistaken, that were delivered there. And yep. you had some, some um, I can't remember if it was a pad or some different things that were going on with the new 800s. But, I mean, literally some of the very first 800s. Because that's like the the uh, North American, um, that Cabela's circuit it was. Uh, yep. A couple guys. Yep. I mean, everybody that was in the top 10 was pulling ripsticks. Everybody. Yeah, and the, everybody. Yeah. And you couldn't get them anywhere. And then 800s were starting. But, I mean, you literally had just a handful rolling out of there. Yeah, and, Texas, Texas red and mud metal back in the day. Yep, there was some yep. of the old, per some of those colors. They believe it or not, as you know, they still work. Me, they probably don't sell as well. Everybody that uses them has them, but um, I still use those things. I've got some with the old uh, VMC Barbarian uh, outbarbs. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, some of the original eight hundreds that we first did, we we had screw eyes in the bill. So while so, I used to be called ancient. the kid when I was traveling around there, I think we both can say that while I've been doing this a long time, it's been my only full-time job my entire life, you've been doing it even longer. And probably a lot of people don't know that, you know, you didn't just start making lures, you know, when you were two years old. I mean, you, you, well, let me tell you, tell them what, what went on. I mean, you were a teacher, right? I mean, that's how. Well, yeah, I was, yeah, I was a teacher up your way in, in Genoa, Ohio. I started teaching uh, high school biology. You know, I wanted to, when I went through college, I, you know, wanted to do a, uh, Oh, forestry for a while, then wildlife management, and I thought, well, I want to make some real money, so let's go teaching route and biology, and oh, I went that route. You know, I won't. Uh, I, I taught for four years and then started this company. But uh, way back in the day, um, uh, Jim Feltman, who owned the name Reef Runner and made a weight forward spinner uh, back in the gosh, gosh, in the '60s, '70s, and um, you know, I went up there after college in the early '80s and uh, helped him. Uh, poor lead, you know, make weight forward spinners, bent wire. Um, he was a paraplegic. And um, so at nights I'd go up and we'd have dinner. And my wife is a nurse, Betsy, and um, she uh, was a nurse at the time working second shift. So I'd go up teach all day and she wouldn't be home at night. So I'd just go from Genoa to Toledo um, down on Loxley Road. I'll never forget that. And then uh, go down to the basement, feed these cats, mold some baits, um, spin some wire, paint some lures. And then come home. So, you know, the way forward spinner thing was the beginning of it. And then I uh, bought that name and all those uh, weight forward spinners from him that did that for years. Uh, and then introduced a cicada. So, I mean, that was the early so times and the early beginnings. When was that approximately? Do you know approximately what year that C was? Yeah, the cicada was like 1989 um, was the cicada. And prior to that, uh, in the early 80s, was all the weight forward spinner. So, like three years prior to that. Man, we were struggling, you know, trying to, because I quit teaching, you know, it's just all or nothing. And actually, the funny thing is, two weeks after I, I quit teaching in the summer, I thought, you know what, this might not be too smart. And um, I did guide. I was guiding back in the day as well. And I thought, yeah, maybe I should still teach, you know. Um, so I went back and s saw if uh, they had my job still available, and they already had filled it. I'm like, well, 
Uh, I'm all in now, so nothing but uh, you know pouring lead, painting, and you know uh, up above my dad's office. It was it was crazy. It was fun. I mean, we had a lot of fun back in the day doing stuff. So a lot different than it is now. That's for sure. You know, it's probably the best job filling that ever happened for you because again, I mean, even today, kids are facing this, and even young adults or adults, you know, hey, do I quit my job? How do I make a living fishing? Because there certainly is not a playbook for this. I mean. It's, it seems desirable, but the reality is, you know, that's what I've done, obviously. And you're working 80 hours a week for 40-hour pay and to get things going. And not everybody makes it like you did. I mean, there's how many people well, fail? It's just yeah. like football players. I mean, how many guys don't become, you know, the next Joe Montana? No, it's it's a struggle. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, I was told years ago, you know, how do you how you make a million dollars in the fishing tackle industry? Start with two? Answers, start with two. And I, there, there have been days where... That's that's been for sure. I think you know? I think I mean, with inflation we might change that story to four, but yeah, it's uh, it is tough, and um, with everything happening in these days and times, and uh, gosh, it's it's crazy, and it's, it gets tougher and tougher. But we still do things here, um, still do things, you know, in our own uh, well, kitchen. And, let, let, let's back up a little bit because I you know I've listened to your stuff enough, and you're of all the people I know, you're definitely fascinating because you're a homegrown, did it yourself kind of you know one man success story. Even though I, you probably would not say it's a one man success story, but um, the reality is, is nowadays things are different. We've got Facebook pushing things, we got YouTube videos and all that. Back when you were doing this, I mean, what I mean, if I remember it was the Cicada. It wasn't it a certain magazine that kind of really made that bump that made things click quick for you or quicker. Yeah, back in uh, actually the uh, cover of 1990 uh, in Fisherman, we did an article. There was an article done by Doug Stangy, and I happened to run into him up at the Detroit Boat Show. Um, prior to that, and they had a big tank they used to cast lures off of called the Hog Trough, and that was a big thing in all the shows. And happened to have a cicada and gave it to him, and he caught a trout and landed at the bottom of his feet and. And, you know, the cicada and the blade baits and all that was kind of born, even though they were out before that. But, uh, you know, with ice fishing and, you know, ice out fishing and the cicada and away it went. And, um, you know, very blessed to be there at that time. And then, um, I mean, the mail order business, you know, my wife in 1990, my son was born in December. And that was a year it got super busy. And, I mean, we had literally a little house, um, all the parts in our house. She was like you know, eight and a half, eight months pregnant. And uh, we were doing baits at the kitchen table. And the mail order one day, we, we put an ad in, in Fisherman back in the day. I'll never forget, it was $4,500 for that ad, a quarter page ad, $500 wow. to produce it. So it was $5,000. We didn't have that money. And she looked at me, she said, well, our credit card limit's $5,000. So if we can't pay for it, we'll put it on credit card and hopefully pay pay for it down the way. Um, and, uh, you know, the first day there was like one mail order and one phone call. The next day it was a couple mail order. And then by the end of the week, I mean, that our little mail order box at the post office was stuffed full of orders. And we had college kids over the winter break, you know, filling mail order and we were hooking lures and it was cool time. And, um, yeah, we needless to say, we paid for the ad and then some, and, you know, cicada took off from there. God, I mean, five grand back then. I mean, that's that's got to be. It might as well have been fifty grand. I mean, that's just. A it was. Lot. It was. It was like putting it all on black, man. Back in the day. Yeah, that's that like was, that is definitely roulette. And you know, the reality is, is, but back then, I don't think people, you know, some of the younger guys and stuff, or don't realize is that was the outlet back then. I mean, In Fisherman was the authority. That's the Al Linder yep. deal. I mean, if you were on their TV show or in their print magazine, you had instant credibility. I mean, plain and simple. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah, it was just amazing. You know, there was a uh, painting by Larry Topol on the front cover and had a cicada dropping down and a uh, big article. And, you know, it was about me being a school teacher and broke. And, I mean, it was a really cool article. And, um, yeah, cicadas took off. And, um, you know, that propelled us, you know, uh, into the uh, crankbait, you know, side of it. And, uh, it was just it was just a cool time, you know, doing sports shows and going to the, with the hog trough and, you know, traveling. Even when Nathan, my son now is twenty, well, I was twenty nine. So I mean, for all those years, that's, I mean, we did. I mean, sports shows were big back in the day, and they aren't so much anymore. So, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a it's just a totally different deal. I mean, and the thing is, is it's funny because I think that so many of your lures have been. 
I mean, just a home run. Like the cicada to me, I can remember doing a, a kid's fishing show in a trout pond. And it was one of those, like, we thought it was going to be taking candy from a baby, right? And, I mean, we're, we've got, like, half a dozen kids out there, and it was just flat out not working. It was like, ugh. And I started throwing a cicada because I brought a handful of different blade baits, and those trout just were chewing it up. We had guys there fishing with their fly rods and all that, and it was just funny because they couldn't catch anything, the traditional dough balls and all that stuff. I mean, as, as popular as the blade baits are getting, especially in the bass market, it's amazing to me that more bass guys haven't tried the cicada. I mean, it, it's got to be one of the few, if not the only, curved blades still readily available. Am I, am I off on that? Um, I don't know. I mean, there's there's some blades available. You know, Hedden has a sonar. and Yeah, but that's a straight you know, blade, though. That's straight blade. Yeah, curved blade. I don't think there's another one out there. You know, we're like the only one. Um, so it's got different action, different vibration, different fall patterns. So... Uh, just like crankbaits, I tell people, you know, blade baits have, you know, it's different blade baits, different patterns, different vibrations. And, um, you know, some days some work better than others. Um, but, um, you know, with us, you know, we, we had a few painted ones, but, uh, the key to what we used, what we did was, you know, we went to all plating, whether it was a silver, gold, black, nickel, copper, and then we put, you know, interchangeable tape wings on them and made them look like jewelry. You know, right. and they were, they're beautiful, the flash and everything and vibration. And I mean, you can catch anything with a blade bait, doesn't matter. I mean, catfish and sheephead and walleye and trout and crappie. And it's just amazing, you know, what, you know, and all year round. So it's, it's always a good lure to have in your arsenal. No doubt. So we went yeah. from weight forwards and melting toy soldiers and all that stuff to obviously starting with cicada. Yep. You, you probably realize, hey, I can't, there's not, I can't quit my job just and sell cicadas. Like, as good as that bait is, there's just the blade bait market is what the blade bait market is. So we need to get into other things. How, yep. what was the inspiration? I mean, the banana bait, you, I mean, I know there's been other banana baits, and I may take some flack on this one, but you revolutionized the deep diving banana bait, in my opinion. Now, I know there's other things out there, lazy ikes and different curved baits. But as far yep. as in a deep diving bait, that's straight up a reef runner. I mean, I don't care. There's been a million people copy it. There's all kinds of things. Some of them you throw on the floor, you can't tell the difference till you put them in the water, and then one works and one doesn't. But how does that come about? I mean, I realize that you're kind of like a mad scientist. Um, you go through these things. I mean, how many trials and failures? Because I remember that there was a bait, your, your very first crankbait is actually sold by a sporting goods store. Now you sold that or no longer produce that. It's not the current reef runner, right? Correct. So yeah, and it's, yeah. How ahead. many t trials and tribulations do you go through to to get to that point? Oh, it's <laughs> it's a ton. I mean, people don't realize. I mean, I, I do tr truly. Um, there was a gentleman up here in Marblehead years ago. I don't know if you remember. His name was Guy Leslie, and Guy passed away. But Guy Leslie had a uh, he made decoys, and uh, he was kind of like out of Woodstock, and um, was a polymer engineer, and had all these kind of woods you know, different types and carve stuff out of them and carve like, just like, like not really intricate stuff, but just working decoy stuff. And, you know, all kinds of, you know, basswood, balsa, you know, pine, you know, all kinds of woods laying around. And being a polymer engineer, he knew specific gravities of stuff. So, you know, one day I was there and he goes, oh, I got this special wood I get from, you know, uh, Central South America or whatever. And he said, hey, you know, I'll just give you some and then, and it ended up turning out to be the same specific gravity of what we use now. It's a plastic called butyrate. So butyrate is not an ABS or, a, you know, a Lexan or something like that. It's like the old school stuff they put in Sears Craftsman screwdrivers in the handles, the clear wow. stuff. You can beat the crap out of them. And so it's got a different sound to it. It's got a funk to it versus a click. Uh, like these new crankbaits, some do have this click sound to it because it's an ABS. Well, but um, so... We you, stayed in that old school realm. Yeah, I don't want to start talking about other baits and things, but me and you have had this conversation, and I've had it with a lot of other people, that a lot of the baits that are really, really popular or have been popular through the years, and we'll, we'll keep those nameless here, but a lot of, of the name baits were also made out of that butyrite and not sure. out of acrylic or ABS, and, and now they have those baits are no longer made out of that material, and now they're made out of acrylic, ABS, whatever, and they don't right. seem to work as good, and that's why those baits are selling on the internet for three, 400 bucks a piece when you could buy them brand new for five bucks. Right, you right. Know? It's just different different technology, and some of the old stuff's good, and like I said, we're hand-glued, not sonic welds. We actually have ladies doing that. So, But getting back to your question, you know, after I whittled something out of wood, I'd always stick it in my pocket and 
you know, get it out from day to day, and I didn't like it, and I'd get another one, I'd whittle it out of wood. And so finally, you know, I get the tool guy, say, okay, I got something that I want to, um, well, actually, I'd put screw eyes in it and go down and run it, uh, like the ripstick first, uh, and took the. Is this on Lake X that of, you won't even take me to? No, this was actually, this was in Upper Sandusky where I grew up. You know, I took it down to the park pond, you know, where I knew it was like there was a, like a concrete, uh, platform out in the park so i was just you know running along the platform because honestly the screw eyes i used were so short i didn't want to catch a fish because i didn't want to rip them out and lose <laughs> the lure i was scared so i just wanted to see how it ran so once i got it you know to run then you know i'd get the guys to you know uh cat it out and you know put it in a mold form and you know the guys at advantage mold in toledo have done such a great job for me and doing that because you know, most of those guys like to fish too. So, well, um, let's let's back up a hair bit because a lot of people, you know, again, this is everyday stuff for you. People at home sitting there, kind of like, you know, just start whittling one out of wood. And I'm gonna try to get a few pictures of those baits. I know you got that little plastic box in your office there with all those originals and the prototypes. Yep. Yep. But that backing up that that special type of wood, and if you don't want to say, I totally understand. But there's a special type of wood that you used, and you kind of skipped over this a little bit. But the reason you were using this type of wood was it had approximately the same buoyancy as that plastic right. bait, right? Yep. Same so specific gravity. Yep. So the the reality is, is now you could, in theory, you know, take something, and when you put it into the material you're actually going to be using, you're getting the same thing. Because some of these baits, people don't realize, like when you put bigger hooks on them and different things like that, all of a sudden the thing's going to sink or it's not going to have the same action. So what you think you're getting, you're not. Right. Well, now there's 3D printing. So a lot of guys are 3D printing stuff. Actually, a lot of guys don't even, I mean... I think we talked about this before, Ross, you know, and, you know, guys back in the old days, you know, the Lori Rapalas, the, the Normans, the, you know, Jim Bagley's, all those guys used to, you know, do their own stuff. And, you know, even the Storm Brothers, you know, and all those people used to whittle their own baits out and make them. And now guys that are starting companies up don't even see their own baits. They're all made in, you know, China somewhere, and they just send them a, you know, well, here's some, here's a copy or here's something that, you know, that we've done. And they don't even touch it. They don't even have anything to do with it. So, um, you know, it's interesting to be able to take a piece of wood and, and hand it to a tool guy. And then, and actually, you know, being here in Marblehead and Toledo, drive up and say, hey, what do you think of this? You know, here's a drawing, here's this. And, you know, actually see the molds, touch the molds, and then run prototypes and then take them back. And, you know, I used to run them off the ferry dock, you know, uh, um, Paladino dock going to Kelly's when a ferry boat would leave. I'd wait till it'd get a little ways away, and then I'd run down and, you know, run a few, you know, baits off the platform, then run back and tweak them and, you know, at the house. So, um, yeah. And, that, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a life thing in all reality. You know, it's just like, like with turkey calls. There are guys that, you know, they hand do these turkey calls. Now you can, you know, like you said, you can make them out of plastic. They're almost as good. The guys really in the know know that that's not the deal, and there's a lot of right. value on the other stuff. And it's kind of like that with fishing lures. And, you know, it definitely, I'm sure, makes your process a lot more difficult to, like you said, I know Straight King has a 3D printer in-house, and they go take a yep. bait that somebody's catching them on that maybe it's a homemade, maybe it's from God knows where, and they've got yep. this thing tweaked and duplicated, maybe make it a little different, let's be honest, and but just a, <laughs> enough to, to make it get by. And all of a sudden, that bait's on the market in three, four months. And I may be exaggerating that time frame, but not a lot. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, you're, you're not. Sometimes even shorter than that. You know, I mean, I think they can turn one around in a month. Right. You know, um, so, yeah, you, you think you have something new and you want to bring it out. And, you know, a month or two, 60 days, and you're like, oh, crap, it's out before I even get it out. So, yeah, and, it's, it's crazy. And, you know, obviously for the last almost 20 years, you know, I've been with you as a, as a pro staff guy. And, and it's just a different it's a different role even now because of those things where we used to sit down with you. I don't know how many hours I've spent in your office. And, you know, we're sitting there talking about things and, okay, the, the frequency, the pitch, this wobble, and all these little tweaks that people don't see. You know, you don't necessarily discuss these things. They just happen to be changed or on a new lure itself. But there really just is so much that goes into that. And I guess that's one thing is tell me, you know, give me some uh, something on, you know, something that made a big difference that you just didn't think it would. Um, you mean as far as, like, you know, changes in a lure? Well, I mean, all the all the little the little idiosyncrasies that people don't realize, and stuff that maybe you didn't even realize till you got a number of years in with the development of lures. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's so many things. I mean, I'm like, like you and I are kind of like gearheads, you know, technical when it comes time to do this. But for instance, like you know, when you're when you're trying to figure out where it's like a teeter totter, you know, you want to get it balanced, you know. 
So in a in a lure, first of all, you have to to balance it up. You know where the like the belly hook is going to be. The tail hook's the tail hook. But then try to figure out where the belly hook goes, and you can't move that. You have to leave that stationary while you try to find, you know, where that fulcrum point is on the bill, whether it be a shallow bill or a deep diving bill, which is a lot harder to to find that fulcrum point where that lure runs. But then you can't change one and then the other, and then you're all screwed up. So you got to change one at a time, um, and then you know, trying to get like again the the lure balanced. And, and find where that sweet spot is, you know, for it to run. Um, you know, I learned many years ago that, um, you know, uh, you know, five thousandths, you know, that's the thickness of three sheets of paper. You know, uh, if you're off sometimes that much, it makes a difference. Um, well, it's crazy. It's crazy. And if uh, there, um, if there's been one bitch about the reef runners, you know, through the years is, is guys on like the 800 in particular, I don't think you can make this claim with the other lures at this point, like the new 44 mag or even a 700 or maybe no. a 600, but the 800 needs, I mean, it's, it's an aggressive tune bait. It's almost like, you know, I think of it, I tell guys when I do seminars and things, I said, you know, you ever fish those little ponds or some little thing where you can see the fish hit and you're, and you're ripping a spinner bait and you just pull it forward a little bit and then stop it. Just just a little bit. And that's when those fish hit. And the natural hunting action that that banana bait or whatever you want to call it, that that 800 has, I think that's why it's so successful. But the reality is, is that thing is not always in perfect tune and, and you've got to take a little extra care to do that. And, uh, no, I, I, and, and I agree. And I mean, like our girls, I mean, they're hand glued. I mean, there are, there are people that actually, you know, glue those baits together. Um, and they could be off five thousandths. And I, yeah, I, you know, people say, oh, reef runners need two. Well, you know, like you and I just talked about the 800 series, the rest of them hadn't had problems with them. And, 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 you know, again, the 800 series really isn't a problem, but nowadays, um, you, again, the internet and all that people complain, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But, um, and I tell people, well, I mean, you're, you're just tweaking it slightly. And a lot of times the biggest, um, deterrent to a lure, uh, the biggest enemy to a lure is a net, you know, you flop in a big fish oh. in the net and it forks it and twists it and, you know, every lure eventually needs to, no matter what. And I also believe that, you know, people kind of forget the fact that, you know, outdoorsmen, outdoor people, I mean, you buy a $1,500 Matthews bow, you still have to sight it in, you know, at 10, 15, 20 yards. And you buy a gun, you know, whether it's a shotgun or, you know, a rifle, and you got a $500, $600 Redfield scope, you still sight it in. But people seem to think that uh they complain if they have to tune a seven eight dollar fishing lure but when i'm saying tune it i mean it is like micro locking it in it's like locking in a bow or locking in a, a gun to you know it's like you need to have that pattern you know tight and it, it's the same thing with a lure you know even some lures you think run good um you could have you know four lures out and i know you've seen this on a day um they could all be chrome blue but one of the chrome blue ones is catching like 80% of the fish. We, yeah, I, I just got done doing a, a seminar at a private club, and I call them paper baits. You know those? And I've definitely got a few 800s, and I've got one 700 ripstick that I've had since the beginning, one of the originals, that just I, so half the chrome is worn right off it. And it's just one of those, I don't even use it that much, but it just flat out works. And I think I told you this. The eye is actually bent a little funny. And mm -hmm. I said, guys always, oh, let me, let me bend that back. I'm like, don't you dare touch that. It's been like that for 20 years and it just flat out catches them. I don't know how many 10 pound plus walleyes I've caught on that bait through the years, but, yep. but at this you club, yeah, at this club, I mean, that was one of the things that when we got done and there was tons of questions, we talk about all kinds of things. We we're talking about current. We we're talking about like what I'm going to think are a lot of advanced tactics and everybody afterwards, the questions were about the crankbait tuning because they basically not that they had questions on crank tuning and crankbait, but they couldn't believe that I kept going on and on about it. And simply yeah. put, you know, I mean, I know you're in agreement with this, or at least I think you would be. You can have the, the exact right color refront, or you can have the right lead, the right speed, you can have it at the right place. If that thing isn't tuned, A, it's not at the depth you think it is. B, it's probably going to tangle up your line. C, it's just not going to catch anything because of the other stuff. Yep, I agree. Yeah, and it's, it's you know, and it's not that every, you know, 800 doesn't, you know, it's not tuned. It's just that, I mean, I mean every bait, uh, you know, I don't care if it's a Rapala, I don't care if it's, a, you know, a, Pradco product or a storm, it doesn't matter. I mean, at some point you got to tune them, but it, it's it's a it's it's a watchful thing, you know. And, and a lot of guys want to tune stuff behind the boat instead of on the side. But you got to watch your baits. You got to just look at them. And it's just after. I mean, you. I mean, like you, Ross, fishing tournaments and guiding and all. I mean, you you can see it almost. It's like 
it's like a sixth sense that okay that lure is like right on the money i mean it's like dead on oh. you know and there's a couple of them that are close but we fish with them anyway super tuning fish, we so. call that yeah when it comes time for tournament and money time i'm pulling the ones out are like dead on you know and and, um, and you know what it's really funny you say it because again going back to this club or the fact that i've got thousands of days guiding and, and it's kind of my business is a little di different because a lot of my guys have their own boat and so these guys are not just out for the day on the lake, but they're trying to learn something. They're trying to, you know, pick up some tactics and such. And the reality is, is these guys are like, man, what, what are you, what are you messing with that? Isn't that thing in tune? I'm like, no, it was until you went into that net with a pair of pliers that could have ripped the teeth out of a grizzly bear, you know, these yeah. giant pliers and they're just going ape crazy on it. And then I, I, you watch guys, like you said, now the bite's really good right now. Right. And these guys yep. are flipping these fish over. I'm like, if we had two or three pounds of cement hanging on that lure, would we fling it over the side? You know? And in all those little things, I mean, if that's not five thousandths, I don't know what is. I mean, it's probably yeah. a whole oh, yeah. lot more than that. So all of a sudden you got yep. this bait that's catching them now because you didn't take five seconds to get that figured out or maybe a little more than that. The reality is now you got a bait that's not going to catch them and you're going to think it's something else. And literally yep. those little things are the difference makers on why guys, or at least hopefully guys like me catch them and other guys often aren't. Yep. It's, it's, it's every lure. So it's, you know, it's just an interesting fact, you know, and, you know what I mean? And, and a lot of little things, you know, like uh, hooks. You know, I mean, you can put bigger hooks on lures to change the action of a lure. Um, I like glow on lures, but not, you know, a whole lot, you know, like spotted or maybe a, a stripe or a belly or something like that. Um, you know, I know you and I have had discussion about chrome and flash and all that. So, I mean, I think there's a, there's a time and place for a lot and, and some for little. So um, there's just things that you learn over time that, you try to put it to use every day when you're fishing. Well, and you know, speaking of that, of since we're on the topic, I always tell people that Reef Runner has its own face. And when I mean that, I mean it quite literally. You tell me about these pad prints because I've actually seen you do this um, in your little Easy Bake Oven or whatever that is. And you know, all of those those pad that's a pad print, right? Is that what it is? Yeah, it's a pad print. It's kind of like if you kind of think about it, it's kind of like silk screen in a shirt, a t shirt kind of um, in essence, but it's a little more technical with it. But um, it's an ink pad print where you make a plate and the plate is like a um, kind of like a frosted mug look and you put like an old transparency like we you know we had in school back in the day and you, know, you put a transparency lay it on this plate and you put it in my little uh, uh, you know like a plate maker but it looks like a miniature tanning booth and uh, it kind of uh, heats it or imprints it um, on the or sun tans it I guess uh, on the uh, on the plate, and then you wash it out with um, you know like an alcohol rub, and then you put it in the oven and bake it. So every lure, every lure that we have ever made and still make today, the the minnow pattern, the black pattern, the minnow pattern, the trout pattern, the you know the uh, perch pattern, bone, any of those patterns of all the lures, all the lures that we've made today have come from our uh, my wife's kitchen. You know I've made those plates from the kitchen and we use those today. So every lure has had that. So, um, yeah, it's amazing how many uh, plates I've made and you know, how many lures that's printed, but you scratch one, you scratch a plate, then you have to, you know, make another one. So we've made a ton of them over the years, but, uh, yeah, every, every design, every, you know, every, you know, me and, um, this gentleman's name's Herb and Herb Byers and Herb did the, uh, you know, all the, uh, the artwork for me. So, I mean, he lives over in Cleveland. So, I mean, all the artwork had to be done at one time. So, I mean, not only do you build a lure, then you got to build the artwork to fit the lure. And then, you know, whether it's a trout or a, you know, a perch or a minnow or whatever it might be. So, you know, all those have evolved over the years and all the sizes of the baits and then the color patterns. And, you know, I said, you know, we can talk forever on the color patterns and, you know, how we used to come up with those. But, uh, Basically, you know me, you know, I, I, I need to lose a little bit of weight. So uh, a lot of our uh, color patterns are named off uh, food. Yeah, I do know that. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to throw you under the bus here, but I'm going to tell you one thing. I don't know if you remember you told me this, and I tell people this all the time. Uh, a good lure has two qualities. It has to do two things. Do you remember this? <laughs> and I, I just, every time I hear it from you, I chuckle, and I know it's been a long time since you've said it. But first of all, you got to catch the fish or the fisherman. Then you got to catch right. the fish and in, in that order. So, you know, again, you were kind of a marketer, even though I don't think you yourself would admit that you're into marketing, but you were a marketer without even knowing it by the way that you did that with the colors and the names and, and, and the wide variety. Like you are a custom lure company. I hear people all the time, like all oh, this custom lure company stuff. I'm like, Scott's been doing that for 20 years. When you have 300 colors, you're a custom lure company. 
I mean, who else yeah. has that? Rapala's got 15 or 20 if they're lucky. Um, yep. you, you were having lures that maybe you wouldn't sell a million of them. Again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but if there was baits that were regionally specific that sold well, you still had that, that color available. Well, and true, and you know, my other favorite saying, fish don't have money. <laughs> Well, that, you goes, know. that goes back to the other one, why you got to sell the fishermen first, right? Yeah, that's true. But, I mean, and there are days, you know, other colors work better than others. But, um, you know, colors are cool. Um, and, I, and the other one I always say is uh, men are worse than women shoe shopping. You know, um, I got a couple in my house that are really bad at shoe shopping. So, <laughs> um, so I, I got to supplement their uh, shoe fetish with uh, lures. So the more shoes they buy and the colors, the more colors I have to come out with, you know, for, for lures to compensate for it so so, so he, it's, it's a never-ending battle i'm going to give you another another ending battle reality is so in my opinion like the reef runner 800 just it still catches them i mean 20 years it's it's still caught them i mean there's been probably ups and downs as things have changed and just you know things go on with lures whether i don't know if i believe that you know the fish see it or had too many of them or whatever i don't know if i'm into that theory but nevertheless as things have gone around that's straight up still catching them. And I think of if, if that as just a straight up good original lure. I mean, we could probably name a handful of bass lures that would fit in that same thing that are just as relevant as today as they were 20 years ago. But how do you feel about the trend of, I know this is kind of a touchy subject, but in reality, it seems like nowadays a lot of companies are throwing just shit on the wall essentially, and they have some big name guys that are pushing them. And the reality is, is if something's in the water, at some point it's going to catch fish, right? I mean... I get guys all the time when I'm out there fishing and they're like, uh, we, we get periods where you could put anything in the water and they're going to bite. But as a guide or a tournament fisherman, I need to do that all the time, not just a couple times a day, a couple hours or minutes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, do you see that same trend as far as, do you think a lot of companies are just pushing things out there? They get some big name guy to endorse it, or they got all kinds of Facebook or some fancy marketing and promotion company. Uh, I mean, you're home. Oh, I, I think, I think to a certain extent that is very true. Um, I think, too, the other, the other uh, thing we can say is, you know, in order to, you know, catch fish, a lure needs to be wet. You know, you got to get it wet to catch fish. Well, if you're, you know, if, if a reef runner's in a tackle box and something else is in the water, the reef runner's not catching fish. So, you know, it gets thrown out there to the Internet and, you know, all the other Facebook and Instagram and all this, you know, whatever, you know, catching fish on this. Well, just because, you know, that's out there on the Internet, guys aren't fishing, you know, let's say reef runners. But, you know, you put reef runners out there, they might be doing better or they might be catching bigger fish. I don't know. But um, to have somebody, you know, out there just a lot of companies now, I think, reaching for straws and trying to bring stuff out that, you know, and I, I'm not a gimmicky kind of guy as far as, you know, lures and lights and whistles and bells and wall this kind of stuff you know i mean gosh i mean remember back in the day i mean there's lures that didn't even have rattles in them for crying out loud um they caught a ton of fish so um i think you know that and then you have to have somebody endorse it that's you know out there and you know the big name or whatever and it, and it sells lures yeah um there are a lot there is a lot to that versus looking at um you know staying with the basics and uh you know, fishing with what you got. But, I mean, I keep hearing stories from guys that are, you know, again, still catching reef runners, not the big names, but catching bigger fish, catching just as many, and um, everything's just fine. So, you know, I, I don't know how many times I've sat in your office through the years, but probably enough hours to almost fill a month. And, I, you know, it's firsthand. I can go from Betsy's desk to yours 10 feet away, if that, and we look at things and everything's, it's just, it's there. I mean, it's, it's top to bottom. We got girls in the back putting, you know, packaging and stuff. I mean, it's a, it's a real American small business, right? And then you're going down, like you said, a couple miles down the road on the ferry dock and you're testing things and you are definitely a minority. I mean, companies like you, and we've got a few mutual friends who have sold their businesses somewhat recently and anymore. I mean, it's just these giant conglomerates that you're fighting against. And I mean, that's got to make things tough. I mean, you've got like the Rappalas, the Pradcos that own just multiple brands, if, if not that being a giant understatement, and having to deal with their marketing teams. I mean, they have teams of marketing people that are, are bigger than your entire company, right? Oh, there's no doubt. And, you know, over the years, I mean, and I will say, you know, you and I both know Cabela's, you know, copied our lures to AT years ago. And um, it, it came down to this. You know, are you going to spend, uh, and my lawyer at the time, my patent attorney, are you going to spend $50,000? to fight them 
and I mean, you are in the right, no doubt. Um, or do you want to send your kids to college? And that's what I was faced with. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's one of those. Him. Don't be a hundred percent right and hundred percent dead. Yep. So it's like you know, it's a no-brainer for me. You know, my kids get an education, and I'll just keep fighting on with what we're doing. So, um, you know, we still do the original. Uh, Cabela still puts it in because it's the original. And uh, but you know, the, the fight against the uh, the expense, you know, as far as you know, the cost of baits, you know, doing it here and versus China and all that stuff, and copies, and you know, over the over the expanse of the years, it's it's been a struggle. Um, but again, you know, I'm, I'm, I look back and talk to Betsy. I mean, how many people that, you know, we've, um, you know, employed, not just here. I mean, you know, the girls gluing baits, you know, the people molding them, you know, us putting them together, packaging the girls here, you know, I mean, all the different people, the characters that we've met along the way, you know, hooking baits and, you know, for us and just all the, the stories and the times and things and the sports shows and, you know, all that stuff, you know, doing it truly you know, uh, the American way and, and what we've done and, and still do today, you know, as far as building a brand and, and building a lure that catch fish, you know, and you know me, I mean, really? gosh, I mean, you're I mean, a pretty many, chill guy. Uh, well, yeah, but how many times I've been fishing? You always rag on me. Hey, I fishing, do. and we laugh because my boat sits in the shop. I blow the and, dust off it every time I go in there and say, this didn't move. Yeah, I know. You I know, think the last the time, you, yeah, the last time I was in your boat was actually to go help you fix a transducer. But, yeah, I mean, it's, like I said, yeah. I, I hooked it up to the hose in the parking lot a couple times, you know, <laughs> make sure it runs, you know. Um, and so, again, other than that, yeah, it's horrible, you uh, know, but I still get out. I mean, we still get out a little bit and still fish, still love to, but, you know, it's, um, you know, when you're trying to run a business and do things, it's, uh, you can always find stuff to do, and um, it's it's enjoyable to hear other people um, well, I think it's, to me, it's, it's, it's more enjoyable to hear other people catch fish or see pictures and, you know, than, than me catching them myself. It I, truly is. I can so relate to that. I mean, doing it. when I, when I go out, I don't, if we're trolling, for instance, I don't have to reel them in. You know what I mean? I enjoy the process. I enjoy figuring it out, watching sure. people catch them. Uh, me netting is just as good as reeling in, if not better, to be perfectly honest. But oh yeah, I guess, I, I guess, you know, backing up just a little bit again, not trying to be negative or anything like that, but you know, again, they say um, imitation is the ultimate flattery, and uh, that's still got to chap your ass a little bit because, again, at least I know with myself, like, people are copying my boat wraps now. You know what I mean? And then they, they, they copy, like, the seminars. Like, I just gave a seminar that was very specific, and here's a couple guys that are supposedly pros that all of a sudden have the exact same topic. You know, they, they copy my slides, taking pictures during my seminar. I mean, that chaps my ass a little bit because the average guy doesn't know that that's happening. You know what I mean? Um, and a lot of guys maybe don't know that Reef Runner, hey, they were the originator 20 years ago. And then also it's it's taken food out of your mouth. You know, I've, our, we have a mutual friend, uh, Fred Zink, and I remember listening to an interview he did. And he's, they said, man, you're pretty serious about this hunting thing. And he says, hey, this is how I put food on the table. Like, you yep. know, for me, if I don't catch fish or, or these things don't happen, this is my income. It's a hobby for you and you and you. But this is really how I make my deal. And well, it's, it's no different for you. Like these lures and these guys copying these things and these China knockoffs. And, and even aside from that, there's got to be a little ego. I know there is with me that, hey, I'm the guy that did this. And now you guys are over here copying because my name's on the wall. You know what I mean? Like this is, this, is, this is kind of a personal attack, even though people don't look at it like that. No, I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean, I, I just got to, you know, as, um, you know, I just, as my wife always says, you know, just keep facing forward and do what's right and, you know, try to keep doing, you know, what we're doing and, uh, you know, worry about yourself. You know, you can't, you know, don't worry about what they do as long as you do what you do. That's and right. That's what I tell my football kids. And, you know, we just got to do what we do and don't worry about it. And then days, like you said, are hard when you see it out there. Like, you know, I mean, all the custom color painter guys, you know, they were painting our colors on different lures. So, I mean, it wasn't a custom color. It was our color on a different body. So they call it custom. So, right. Um, Again, and, and 99% crazy. of the population goes, there's nothing wrong with that. But you're sitting here and you're like, no, 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 that's my color. Why are you calling it, you know, Bob special? Like that's Scott, like I, me and, and one of your guys, or maybe me and you, we've worked on colors together. You know, yep. I mean, how many times have I sat there and I'm like, Hey, let's do this. Let's do that. That's what people don't realize when you come out with a new pattern, there's probably five or six variations of that and how we go through that to find out there's one or two that generally excels. 
And then also, you know, ultimately when it's those one or two, and if it's six to one half and the other, you do which one is more cosmetically pleasing or easy to paint. I mean, the reality of it. Sure, sure. And, and just like, too, is like, and, and, and you've been good at promoting over the years and, and um, you know, seeing stuff. And that's, you know, like trends, you know, it's kind of like, it's why I did the 44 mag. You know, it's just starting a new trend. You got to, you know, like Lee Iacocca used to say, you lead, follow, or get out of the way. So, you know, I like to lead a lot of times and get out there in front of it and say, okay, you know, here's a different profile. You know, it's not, you know, a mental bait. It's a shad bait, and it's, you know, deep diving, the deepest in its class, and so forth and so on. So you just try to get it out there and, and try to get people, you know, thinking, hey, you know, this is, you know, uh, a different deal. Uh, I can see it, uh, profile and all that. And uh, just do your own thing. You know, you just try to do well, your own thing. Well, and, and, you know, it's funny because I don't remember. It's longer ago than I probably want to admit but I remember sitting in your office and we were talking about like cheap sunglasses and blue Hawaiian and stuff like that. And you're like, yeah, I just don't sell those as well anymore. I think I was probably picking a few up for myself. And uh, I remember you were telling me about, and again, correct me when I'm wrong here, but you were telling me about some of the top 10 colors that you've had through the years and stuff that I used, you know, back in the 90s. And they just weren't selling as well. Now, obviously, part of it is, is, you know, guys get them. You don't lose a million of them. But the reality is, is when that bare naked thing came out, like Cranberry Crusher, I mean, the, uh, I can't remember all the names, but like the, uh, the barely naked, is it? The one that's white and um, yeah, red Yeah, Pearl throat? Ghost. Pearl Ghost. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I could name off a half a dozen colors that like Grape Ape, I mean, yada, yada, that those were just flat out on fire. And I don't know if it's, you know, again, this is speculation on both our parts, right? But is it, was it the lake being cleaner or whatever? But all of a sudden, chrome came back. And my God, if you're not using a chrome bait on, on the, I don't know about the Great Lakes as a whole, but at least on the Western and Central Basins of Lake Erie, you're in deep duty times. Um, yeah, I just think people are using more chrome now. Again, back to your theory. I mean, if a bait's not getting wet, it's not catching fish. Agree. I agree, but you man, know? I'll tell you what, as, as a guide, and that's, I know why we've worked together so closely through the, you know, a couple decades is because when I'm out there pulling six, eight, ten lines, all of a sudden you start to see, like, you know what I mean? You got one lure that's out fishing everything, then you pull another one in, put another one out, and I don't know what it is. I probably would argue this more than you, but the Chrome stuff in the last maybe two or three years, and you have to have seen it in your sales a little bit too, they just seem to be doing a lot better. Yeah, Chrome, I mean, actually like five, six years ago, Chrome was like almost out of the picture. That's, that's, what, know, that's what I mean. That's when you were telling me, because yeah. like I, I would ask you yeah. about some colors and stuff, and none of the new colors had Chrome in them whatsoever. And I'm like, no. what's going on? You're like, well, people aren't buying it, they, for the fish must not yeah. be working on it, so... Yep, and then, like I said, now we've gone back to, you know, we've, we've, we're doing chrome, but also we, we did that sparkle flash lure where we've actually put silver sparkle in it and then put a piece of chrome flash tape, you know, or an insert in the middle, whereas you're not getting all the flash, but you're getting, it's kind of like a light switch. Every time I paint a lure, I look at, okay, a light switch, a strobe, on and off, on and off. So you take that lure and you turn it side to side, side to side. So what's a fish? It might not see red and green like a stoplight it might see blue and yellow or it might see purple and pink it might but it sees something that it's it's a light switch it's on and off so what two colors three colors you know top belly side what you know that's going to give that fish when it looks at it it's it's something that's it's strobing it's looking it's it's not just something there and it's again back to the i don't know i'm you know changing stuff that's like the dot pattern you know it's not one fish it's it's a bunch of eyes. You know, it might not see chartreuse, green, blue, red, but it's, it might see it in 3D or different dimensions. And now it sees a bunch of eyes, and it's going to go bust up that ball of bait, you know, uh, in a single lure versus one profile. So, you know, um, and if it's chrome, that day, fine. But um, Yeah, chrome doesn't know, always not, work. I mean, it's not, I don't yeah, know I know. That, but No, I don't know that. But chrome, a lot of times, when you look at chrome down, it's what amazing is. It gets you know, you black, at, doesn't it? it? It's black, yeah. yeah. It goes dark because it doesn't. If there's no light to reflect, you know, down deep, there's no light, so it's it's black, you know. And can, also on like yeah. calm days, people don't realize that, um, you know, that surface is a mirror, you know, and it's not being broken up, so there's no light getting there. So a lot of times, you know, back in the old days, again, when the when the lake would go flat, people would fish deeper. Well, those walleyes would come shallower because that that smooth mirror finish on top was actually reflecting the water on top, not allowing sunlight to, to penetrate. So um, it's just different ways of looking at it when you're out there enough. And like Chrome, I said, 
in black lures, you know, some black patterns have also come back, you know, around or different people want, you know, colors painted on a black lure. So to me, that's more, you know, on the chrome line, even though it's not chrome, you know, but it kind of, you know what I'm saying? It goes I do, I do. I, and yeah, with spinner that's blades, it's the same thing with, with nickel versus silver plated and and I don't know, but I can tell you that I feel fortunate. It's a good thing you live a couple miles down the road and you snuck me some of those early prototypes of that uh, that molded in sparkle uh, bait, whatever you're calling that now. But those yep, things fly sparkle out. Sparkle flash. Yeah. Sparkle flash. I can tell you sparkle flash is it's a sexy deal. That straight up catches mine. I had a few clients when I used them, and they were like, what is that? And where do you get them? I'm like, you can't take a picture of this. This We aren't even talking about this one yet. And yeah. Again, that's one of those. And, and you've had a lot of things like this. I know I've I got a boxes of baits that i've you know had from you that we've tried and they just didn't work and that's, that's no. part of this whole process that people don't realize you don't just come out with x number of things and all of a sudden that's on the shelf at at fish usa or someplace else i mean the reality is a lot of failures go into what is at, actually on the shelf right now yeah and you know i i god bless all the people that call me and i appreciate it and say hey, i want to be on your pro staff or field tester and all that stuff but you know, I love it, and I and I try to help all I can. But in reality, like we just talked about, when that lure hits the market, it's already been field tested. You know, it's already been ran. You know, I mean, I can't put something out there that, you know, hey, I'm a, you know, you're the uh, guinea pig for me. You know, and here's right. here's something go out and sell a bunch of them, and they might not even work. You know, I can't do that. You know, um, so, but there are things that you know we need feedback on. Um, and it's nice to know that, you know, hey, can you change this or look at that? And, you know, how about that? And so, um, yeah, we've, we've made tweaks and modifications over the years because of what customers have said and, and paint jobs and all that. So it's cool. I mean, they are, you know, a pro staff. They are a field testing team um, out there. And that's that's the that's the good part of it. Well, you know, the one thing is just like me meeting you, you know, 20 some years ago, even though you only live a couple miles down the road from me at this point. But you meet some interesting characters and you know, some of them I've met have been <laughs> back through your back UPS door, to be honest with you, mostly in passing, but there's, there's a lot of stories. I mean, there's a lot of characters in tournament fishing, don't get me wrong. And guide clients and some of the, the guys that we know from back in the day. I mean, like the, you know, the Jim Foffriches of the world that we both know a lot of these, these guys that are a lot of, are unfortunately no longer with us, but tell me about some of these guys that just are the people that just make you go. Hmm. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of them. I mean, like, you know, like, when I'm thinking, you know, like, you know, I'm, you and I both know Jim Steckey. You know, wealth of knowledge, been fishing forever. Mr. Happy, as your daughter calls him? Yeah, Mr. Happy. Everybody thinks he's grumpy, grumpy old man. He's really not, but he is. Um, and then, I mean, but he's a wealth of knowledge, an excellent fisherman. Um, there all the time. But, I mean, I've had characters, I mean, people that put hooks on. I mean, there's there's been times, Ross, where, gosh, I mean, one guy was a fireman, retired fireman, and... I mean, he would do 1,500 lures a weekend, hooking them. I mean, split ring on the nose, two hooks on an 800, and and 1,500 on a weekend. So so let's back this up a little bit because I've been there and seen this, so to let people at home kind of understand. Back in in your back door there by the UPS door, there at least used to be is either pop top, um, like cardboard containers, or there was cafeteria trays at one point, I remember basically yep. something like that. And no, they're, they're, they're beer, they're beer flats, yep. pop flats out of cardboard. Yep. Yep. And so you'll have those lures lined up there just like in a, in a, in an assembly line and you've got them stacked yep. on top of each other. And then these guys yep. go back home and they essentially use, I don't know, butter knives or split ring pliers. I've seen both ways where guys do that. Yep. And then split ring pliers are, yep. And they'll sit there, watch TV and sit in a chair, you know, and, uh, it's piecework, you know, the, the, the good, the good, the good, uh, lure hooking weekends always had a football game on or a NASCAR race or golf event or sporting event or something like that. And, you know, they, they were like hooking machines. And, um, you know, I mean, there's people that, uh, who, I mean, uh, I mean, we, we've been affiliated with people that have, uh, you know, lose their, have used their lures for projects, you know, like put a new bathroom in their house and then they were done hooking and, uh, put a new, uh, you know, up, up ground plastic Walmart swimming pool in their house, and they were done. And then there's been people that, uh, you know, I mean, uh, just it, it's just crazy. Just the, uh, you know, uh, you know, picking them up in vans and having, you know, their husbands and wives doing it. And then their kids start doing some of them, and 
you know, I mean, those are the old days when we were, you know, just blowing them out of here and people were hooking them right and left all over the peninsula where they, you know, I was the biggest pimp in Marblehead because I had all the hookers, you know, working for me and putting wow. lures together. So, wow. uh, yeah, so it was good. Um, it was fun. And like I said, we've met a lot of people along the way. And, yeah, that's just you know, one of those, people. that's a job that you just go, who in the hell is going to do that? But yet here they are in little Marblehead, Ohio. Yep. Well, my dad used to do stuff for me, but you can't, you know, my dad used to hook himself all the time, but you can't be afraid of him. That's the thing. You know, we've had lawns for, I've had bank managers, you know, hooking on the side for me, you know, know about, I've had, you know, hospital people hooking for me on the side, you know, managers of restaurants. Uh, my dad owned an insurance company. Um, I mean, and just, just people, he just wouldn't, I mean, I've had them delivered to me on a, uh, garden tractor van, um, it's crazy. I mean, it's, it's, you know, to sit back and think about it, I should write it all down. I'll forget, but, uh, it's, it's, you know, I'd have to go to people's houses and sit there and, you know, help them hook lures, talk BS. And that's the fun part. You know, you might sit there for a half hour, an hour, and you know, hook lures with them and talk and what's happening with your kids and how you doing. And, you know, I mean, and where you go, but, uh, <laughs> you know, you don't see a whole lot of that anymore. The reality is, where do you see Reef Runner going? I mean, now that you've, you've kind of gotten this technological age a little bit and you're, and you're jumping forward, I mean, what can we expect to see for out of you guys? Uh, you know, I think we're going to try to stay on the edge, you know, um, leading edge, like I said, with, you know, new lures and new stuff and and um, colors here and there. Um, you know, if there's something out there that I think needs to be addressed as far as a category, uh, I'm not going to follow people. Like, um, like I said, I've, I've got another minnow bait in a desk drawer that's been 3d printed but eh, don't need a new minnow bait right now um you know focusing on the you know that rip shed the 44 mag for a while here and some new colors here and there and then you know then we got some other things we're working on and playing with so kind of looking forward to the future and, and see what happens well I, I i definitely will not blow your cover because i've been working with you a little bit on a new bait and we'll leave it at that yep. can i even tell them what we may be using it for or is that still undercover I'm still trying to keep it quiet. Okay. I like to keep things quiet because as soon as you tell something, everybody asks questions. So. I, 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 I can appreciate <laughs> yeah. that. It, it's, yeah. let, let's just say it's it's outside the box. A little bit. Yep, a little bit. I, I think it's cool. So It's outside the um, box. You know, the 44 yeah. mag isn't necessarily outside the box, but it's definitely a, it fills a much different need. I caught a ton of fish on that. Um you know, in, in the fall here, just kind of testing that out and learning all the little idiosyncrasies. And, you know, the one thing I think we both kind of learned together is, and just from a bunch of hours running, is that bait doesn't like it super slow. It likes to be run a little faster. So that's a little yep. tip for anybody here that's, you know, that's listening to this. I, I've wasted a lot of time. I like to fish slow. Everybody knows me knows that I, I'm not the guy going Mach 10, but that bait likes it a little, and I'm not saying fast, but just not super slow like that I traditionally do with 700s, 800s, and even 600s. Yeah, it'll love it fast this summer. I know that. So it'll be interesting because I was pulling it last year at, you know, like two, eight, three mile an hour. And I thought, cool. You know, we were catching fish. I'm like, wow, we're like trucking along here. So um, three, two, three, five. I mean, I, it's, it'll be interesting. We'll see if we can change that because you're just covering more ground, you know. So um, it, again, you know, that's just something that we wanted to do and I wanted to do and just kind of change, change it up and, and, um, give people you know something else that they can uh, you know have a go-to lure you know another go-to lure again and like i said new lures bringing them out is always fun and you know people are like what are you doing that for they're like okay you know here's why and then they're like oh okay so it's always fun so we'll see again you know, like we talked about it's like linguine you throw it against the wall see what sticks well i want to wrap this up with kind of an inside joke i'm going to give everybody here a little minor thing i, I do these seminars you know, quite a bit. I've probably done about 15 to 20 this year already and, or, you know, in the last 12 months anyhow, as we go through the boat show stuff. And I always, my seminars are more about, you know, doing the right thing, putting your boat in the right place, how we do that, high speed marking, right? Calibrating reels, all these little things that you can go do, right? Not decision-making, but just more of preparation. And after you do all these things, you know, lure color is about number 20 on that list of things that are important, right? Lead, speed, you know, reels, all that stuff, location. And everyone at the end of these things still says to me, it's just an inside joke with all my buddies. So they'll say, hands up, what's your favorite color reef runner? So leave me with this. Give me the five if five reef runner colors if you could only out of the 400 you've had through the years or whatever. If Scott's only got five colors to fish with for the rest of his life, what are they? It's always the one that's catching fish. 
Wow. Wow. You know, I, I didn't know if you were going to cop out on me like that or you were going to try to like drive sales to something or what the deal is. But I mean, for me, you know, like help me on this a little bit. Let's go with like Purple Demon. We're going old school. Original Perch. Wonder Bread of one variety. Um, cran or um, I already said that. Pink Lemonade. Pink Lemonade's been like dominant over the years. And you uh, know, Iridescent. I mean, you look at how many people are copying the color Iridescent. Um, and blue, great color. Blue Hawaiian would have to be in there for myself because you know that flash, the orange belly, the chrome blue. Yep. But well, and I like I like uh, Pearl Ghost is like my probably the favorite of mine. So I had to pull it out of you, but but it is Pearl Ghost. That's that might be the one. Pearl Ghost is my favorite. By and then I think yours is probably Purple Perch right now. It, that is no joke. I I got you to paint some of those custom if you want to we call did. it that for me. Um, the forty four mags in purple perch just because of you. So yeah, you, we got that. So you did. I, I'm a still a ghost guy. You know, I like that car. I don't know why. It just is what it is. I, I'm uh, I'm with you. I like what works, and I have no preconceived notions. But um, sometimes they just start to get on these trends. But again, you don't put it in the water. You can't catch them. That's that's a fact. And if it ain't tuned, you ain't gonna catch it no matter what color it is. So no, nope. And I think, like you said. It's confidence. You have confidence in what you're, you know, running, no matter what people say. And, um, you know, you got to have confidence in, you know, the program that you're doing. And, um, you know, like you said, colors down that list. But uh, there are a couple that, you know, you start with every day that you know that you have confidence with and you can catch fish with. And then from then you, you go to different things or maybe what you're hearing about. So, you know, if you have four lines out, you always put the one you want out. Maybe you put one that, you know, you've heard about. You know, and another one that uh, you're thinking about, and then the next one, who knows, you know? So you always got to no start doubt. out with, with a spread, but uh, always put those couple confidence lures on there. That's what it's all about. Confidence definitely is not a killer. Well, I want to thank you for coming with us here on the Big Water Podcast, and I tell you, I hope we have it on here again uh, in the near future. We maybe can talk about that new bait, um, which we oh, definitely, sure. I know we can't talk about um, yet. But you've got some, you've yeah, got a couple I, things that you've shared with me, and we've worked on one of them together. That's I, I think is kind of exciting. And um, again, I appreciate your time and all your insight. Uh, people don't realize how much goes into making a lure. I mean, we're not talking about marketing; we're talking about actually getting that ready. And it's definitely probably easier than it used to be. But you're you got that old school charm, and I think that you know it shows, and that that bait catches them. You know, just as good as it does, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Well, I appreciate that so much, and you know, it's it's been great having you uh, as a, as a friend over the years, and I uh, appreciate all you've done for us. And uh, it's fun, you know, it's a journey, and uh, you know, if more people would fish, the uh, less problems we probably have in this country. So, That's a fact. Um, it's good to be a part of it. Well, thanks for joining us, Scott. Appreciate your time. Oh, thanks. Very blessed to be here today, and uh, take care, Ross. Bye. Bye. I want to thank everybody for tuning into the Big Water Podcast. We will be here again. But long story short, Big Water Fishing, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or the web, that's where we're at.